Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, so, Rudik, I, I'll uh, allow me to take one minute to me to give my my uh, you know same uh, kind of a, a pitch on why we are engaged and what you know what I'm looking for also. So foundationally, personally, I'm interested in uh, what you said as meaning. You know how is language or meaning and representing brain. I'm interested in that more in the perspective of potentially informing future ai techniques so but for that i need to you know have some high level basic limited understanding to get motivated so that's my personal uh, bias alone additionally though for the ai institute i just uh, felt that um, in the usc context there is a larger opportunity uh, i had done a very large proposal we did not win but i think we did well but we did not somehow win uh, Muri involving uh, two guys uh, from um, uh, IMB, uh, you know, uh, Amit Almor and uh, uh, Doug Waddell. Um, and then I got to know Jane and uh, Jeff, uh, and then uh, we felt that we should have a university wide uh, kind of initiative to bridge it to increase the, you know, to, to basically, you know, really have a unique strength on our campus at the intersection of AI and neuroscience. From that, we cooked up the you know thing about uh, getting the funding for hiring two uh, new faculty, and uh, that's why we have Christian and Vignesh. And um, we had one small project started uh, with Jessica, uh, and that's going on. And you know some initial results are coming just about now. And uh, the whole idea is that anytime we do that kind of thing, our idea is to invest the time and effort to define larger projects. Now, if it so happens that there's nothing in it for me, but for, you know, for, for a Christian, it is more, will still be a successful, uh, you know, uh, thing. So idea for this one, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, really spend time to closely work with you in particular. And as in one instance of, you know, uh, neuroscience colleagues, um, uh, and then um, without the access to data, without the access to well-defined problem, we computer scientists can't do much. So uh, for us, it is a good pool, and that's why we're interested. In addition to getting, um, uh, you know, Christian and Vignesh on board, uh, I also have been pre-investing our own money and thing uh, in anticipation of success. And I've been in the past often su be successful in making the right bet. So that is why, uh, you know, uh, I hired Yuxin, who has a master's in neuroscience, uh, but wants to do PhD uh, at the intersection of AI and neuroscience and develop new models. Um, and uh, and uh, Deepa, uh, who came here as a uh, internship uh, or internship, but uh, is likely to join or at least interested in joining us as a PhD. So we'll continue working on that. Additionally, um, you know, Behruz uh, is joining our PhD program and he represents um, uh, again an interesting uh, choice for me. Uh, because uh, he is into uh, healthcare application for more than three years uh, in Italy, and um, uh, he has worked with biosignals and uh, in some in, in that sense. So uh, he, you know, again interest in health and uh, AI. Uh, so that is very good. Uh, Bezad is our, of course, deep learning, you know, uh, uh, expert as a postdoc. But beyond that, uh, one person who could not join today, uh, his name is Amitava Das. And uh, he's in India. Uh, he'll be joining us on February 1. Uh, and um, if the things go right, but he'll be joining us as a uh, research associate professor. Okay. He has eight year plus experience after a PhD and multiple postdocs, and uh, he's been assistant associate professor before. So, uh, and he has some experience in um, uh, uh, image processing, uh, but also broadly, not, not in neuro, neuro image processing, and uh, also uh, in, in his particularly focused on multimodality. Uh, so it, what I'm saying is that ultimately, we are after doing the preliminary work as part of this project, mm -hmm. hopefully to go towards bigger, uh, you know, meaningful joint projects uh, where, um, you know, there's half coming from science, half coming from AI to uh, you know uh, to to do things that we e neither of us alone can do that's yeah. okay the, I, i'm done with my spiel please start continue oh good 
Great, yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, uh, saying that. And um, my own background is also in computer science. And my originally, uh, I was interested in AI and doing neural networks. And that's how I got interested in the brain. And gradually sort of I shifted towards the brain to the point where I'm now doing the brain psychology stuff full time. Uh, but I have still have roots, the original uh, idea. So I have some thoughts about, you know, uh, I have a lot of interest in, in uh, uh, connecting, connecting these fields. And uh, I have some theories, biases about what would be the best way to make computers smarter and have uh, sort of have uh, what is the uh, semantics when in artificial system, what does it mean to understand something and so on. So uh, that is ideal. Uh, I forgot to just so, that, so that Revati doesn't feel bad. I forgot to mention Revati. She uh, does most work in image processing in my group. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, great. So, uh, so uh, yeah, so I think uh, the, we have people with uh, very uh, uh, kind of uh, different but related backgrounds that can bring a lot of different skills. So, so that's a, that's a great uh, great thing to have uh, on the team. Um, so, if we talk about uh, specifics for this particular project, um, uh, um, we have three data sets we want to process. Two of them are functional MRI. One is a stroke data set. So, these are patients with uh, stroke. Okay, so let me start with the stroke one first. Uh, uh, that will be relatively easier to explain. So in this, what we have is a, a, an MRI scans of the brains of the patients after they had stroke. And then the actual location of the lesion in the brain has been marked by a neurologist. So we know where which part of the brain is uh, good and which part is lesioned or damaged. And then these brains have been normalized to put into a standardized space. So all of the people with stroke, our brains are sort of lined up together. So they are in a standard space so we can compare them with each other. We can say that this particular area is damaged in patients A, B, and C, but not in patient D and so on, because the brains are in the same space. So this is a lesion. And then for these patients, we have a number of behavioral measures. So we have them do these neuropsychological tests and uh, we get some kind of a performance measure about their level of impairment in, in, in some task. So we have lots of different tasks. Uh, things, of course, things that are particularly of interest to me are uh, tasks related to semantics. So understanding meanings of words and understanding sentences and which patients are impaired and which patients are not impaired and so on. Uh, but there are many tasks related to language and speech processing, as well as things like uh, working memory, attention, and things like that. Um, so uh, uh, the way we process this normally is we do uh, is we do lesion symptom mapping uh, process. So we associate brain damage or lesion with the symptom or the behavioral performance. And at the end of the process, we get some sort of a map of the brain saying that if this area of the brain is damaged, then those patients are much more likely to have a deficit in the function that you, you were, you were, you were uh, you, uh, uh, that was of uh, interest. And the other areas are for something else, but they are not relevant to this function. So it's a, it's a way of figuring out which brain areas, brain areas or brain networks are important for doing which function. Um, so we do this normally using linear regression standard methods. Uh, then we also have implemented uh, support vector machines for doing this process, multivariate methods. Uh, that also work, but they have some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, and one of our interests is to we'll try to see if any we can improve these methods, uh, possibly using some, some other techniques related to deep learning or other methods to see if the, if the lesion symptom mapping can be made a little bit uh, better, we can extract more information out of it. Um, so, oh, so that is what, so this is one data set. Should mention that um, a student, uh, an undergraduate student from India contacted me and has had a lot of background in machine learning. 
And so I gave him this project as like a subset of this data to him to process. And he has been working for the last few months in uh, uh, applying deep, trying to develop deep learning methods for doing for doing lesion symptom mapping. And I think he's doing a very good job. So my plan was to introduce him uh, sometime in the next week or so, if possible, to you guys to connect him up and uh, he can describe what he has done and then you can give your input feedback and we can we can continue from there but he i think he has been doing a good job in he, and he has he, he has already made some progress but there are many other things that can be done so um he can be so, uh, part of the part of the team and uh, in the future we can call him here also if he if he wants to come but uh, he's in he's a student in bits pilani Right now, I believe in the third year. Uh, that, 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 good to know. I also uh, graduated from Bispilani, and uh, uh, I've uh, had several Bispilani students uh, uh, as interns. He, and and uh, you know, uh, one or two have come here also as interns. So uh, certainly we know them very well. Okay. Uh, and they have done master, uh, their bachelor's thesis with me. Uh, remotely, currently, one student is doing very well and doing mass is basis is with me. Okay, excellent, great. Okay, so so this uh, so this data set is uh, relatively uh, straightforward because what we have basically is a brain with some part of the brain being damaged, and then we are correlating the damage with the behavioral performance. Right, we are trying to understand where uh, where damage leads to impaired performance. The other two data sets are, are, uh, are functional MRI data set. So I am not sure how much, how familiar you guys are with functional MRI. Do you generally have an idea about how MRI works or I can give a short like an introduction. Would that be helpful? Uh, I, I mean, uh, Christian might know more than others, but uh, please give the introduction. I think that's best to get started on the common thing. Okay, so so functional MRI is a way of uh, measuring activity in the brain um, uh, without using any type of invasive methods like actually implanting electrodes uh, uh, or doing doing surgery or doing anything in a uh, in in vivo. We can measure uh, what which areas in the brain are working hard or active using this method. Um, it is not a direct measurement of uh, neuronal firing. So it doesn't tell us exactly where neurons are firing directly, but it tells us that indirectly because the areas in which uh, neurons are firing tends to consume uh, more oxygen in the blood. And then new blood, uh, new oxygenated blood comes to that area to supply more oxygen. And this difference between oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood is measured by is the MRI signal. So this is called the bold signal. BOLD standing for blood oxygen level dependent. So this is the signal that we are measuring. So we can think of it in a simple terms, basically as this is, if we see a high signal in a brain area, that area is working hard to process the stimulus that you presented. If a if signal is low or just uh, uh, fluctuating around the baseline, then that area is probably not working not working hard to process the stimulus. Now, a characteristic of the fMRI is that it has very good uh, spatial resolution, but poor temporal resolution. So spatially, we can know which part of the brain is active or working to, the, to close to one millimeter. Typically in the uh, studies, we have uh, uh, areas that are about two or three millimeters cubic cubic millimeter, so two millimeters cube or three millimeters cube. But that is a relatively precise measurement about of the location in the brain where things are happening, right? Um, so uh, it has a good uh, spatial resolution. Um, each of these little areas in the brain are called voxels for like volumetric pixels. So it is just like a pixel in an image, except it is three dimensional because the brain is three dimensional. And in a given image of a brain, you might have 200,000 voxels, okay? So the entire image is going to be composed of 200,000 voxels and each voxel will have a time course for signal going up and down telling us that is uh, whether the area, the voxel is being active or not being active and so on. 
So is it FRI, fMRI has come into different fidelity and this is the standard, uh, you know, so, you know, 200,000 you said Voxel? Yeah, so, so when, you, when you are conducting the scan, you have a ability to choose a certain range. Uh, so if you want, you can go up to, for example, a one millimeter cube voxels, but that will take, it will take longer to acquire one brain image. Uh, and you can choose larger voxels and acquire brain images very fast. So it's a, it's a compromise between how fine of a resolution you want versus how many images you want to collect. So typically people use sort of this around something like three millimeter, three cubic millimeters or two cubic millimeter voxels as a compromise. So it is the area is small enough, but the speed is not too slow. Um, and it takes about uh, two seconds to acquire an image, uh, it, it used to be about two seconds. Nowadays, with better scanners, we can get that down to about one second. So we get the image, entire image of the brain in about one second. The image is acquired slice by slice, and then you put together all the slices to make a full brain image. So all of this, I can show you in more detail uh, it, at some later time. But right now, I just briefly mentioned that you know it is Images acquired slice by slice, it takes about one second. So each image represents one second of, of time period. And then uh, we acquire those images over, let's say 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, So you, we will get uh, about 60 image, uh, images in a minute. And then for 10 minutes, we will have 600 images. So for each voxel, we will have a time course with 600 uh, uh, time points. Uh, that will be our signal. Uh, then another uh, side. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, how much would we miss from the brain signal within this one second? How much would we miss? Yeah. How much uh, activities we wouldn't capture within this one second? Uh, so what do you mean? Like the if the if the activities the actual activities of course happening at a millisecond scale, but our signal is sort of an averaged value over one second. So we are averaging that activity over a period of one second. So mm -hmm. that fine grained details that the millisecond level activity is not captured, but we get an overall picture of things are happening or not within that one second. Okay, thank you. So you, you will notice that this is like the opposite profile of EEG and EEG has really good uh, temporal resolution but has poor spatial resolution. So you know sort of things are happening in the front of the brain or something like that, but you don't know exactly where. So both techniques are sort of complementary. Uh, another characteristic of the fMRI signal is the that because it depends on blood flow, um, the, the, there is a time course, the, the, as soon as you present a stimulus, you don't see the response to that stimulus in, instantaneously. So once you present something, let's say you, you are presenting picture of a face and there is a certain area of the brain that is processing the picture of that face, the actual signal, the neurons are going to fire instantaneously, but the effect of that is going to be seen about five seconds later. So between four to six seconds, you will see the response in the brain area that is uh, processing faces uh, peak, and then the, and then it will go down. So there is a delay of four to six, about uh, roughly five seconds uh, from uh, from the presentation of the stimulus and the response. Right. So it is not like EEG where you present it and you have immediately like an ERP. Uh, you know, N170 or something like that, that you see immediately. So, so this has to be taken into account in the analysis. So uh, this is, this is part of the analysis pipeline. So we present these, uh, so this, this curve that is produced by presenting a stimulus is called the hemodynamic response function or the HRF. So what we do is we have a uh, set of stimuli, we convolve the set of stimuli and the timings with the hemodynamic response functions. So that tells us basically what, if a brain area is processing that stimuli, what should the um, signal in that brain area should look like, right? So we have sort of an ideal signal that we are looking for. And then we go into every voxel of the brain and look for that signal of that shape. So if an, if an 
area of the brain is responding to that stimulus, the signal in that area and our ideal signal will match. Otherwise, it, they, they will not match. So the statistics will be low. So that is the general idea. So for uh, our purposes, uh, all of this convolving and hemodynamic response function, as such, from your point of view, I think you don't really need to worry about that too much because what we can do is to extract the response to each stimulus um, with appropriate time adjustments and averaging and essentially produce a vector uh, that, that, that represents the peak response to that stimulus in the whole brain. So you will get basically a, um, a vector a single instead of a time series, you can get a single vector uh, corresponding to each stimulus item. So, in, if in my experiments, if I have 30 faces, then we can give you 30 vectors, each vector being 200,000 items long for 200,000 voxels in the brain, uh, representing the response of uh, the whole brain to to that uh, to to that face. Right. So, some voxels will be informative, some will not be informative and so on. Um, so uh, this, uh, the time delay and the exact shape of the response, all that we can sort of take it out of the equation and then just work with these, these, uh, these, these vectors that become like, we become like data points. But I just wanted to mention it in case you want to go back to the raw data and do some different processing in, in, a, in some event, then, then, then it is possible. Okay, um, so does this make sense a little bit or uh, uh, confusing? Uh, just for my improved understanding. So uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, uh, the vector you create, what was that? Yeah, so the, the vector is simply the uh, value of each voxel. Um, uh, oh. The, the bold the bold response of each voxel to that stimulus but uh, but but is it a map to the anatomy of the brain or a spatial yes. in the brain yes it is it is mapped to the anatomy of the brain so each voxel has a location in the brain that we can map it back to so if after doing the analysis if you realize that this set of voxels is particularly informative like this each voxel is like a feature so you decide that out of 200,000, these thousand features are really important for, for, for processing the stimulus and others are not important. We can take those thousand voxels and go back to the brain and map them on the brain to see which area of the brain it is. Would you um, map these uh, MRI to a common, uh, common atlas before uh, providing these data or they would be kind of raw? the raw voxel from the as recorded yeah good, yeah good, good question yeah so normally we have uh, we have mapped them to a common uh, common brain so all the brains are normalized and put it into a standard space and then so all the vectors have the same exact size and they map on the brain in the same way but we also have the original data if you somebody was interested and wanted to do it before this transformation we can provide that also, but normally it is easier to work with this kind of standardized vectors. Mm -hmm. uh, for all all the subjects and all those experiments conditions, they all have the same meaning basically. Perfect. Professor, does uh, uh, generally how bad is the noise in the fRMI signals? Uh, yeah. So if, if everything is noisy, of course, yeah. So so noise is it, that is kind of the central issue. It is hard to quantify how bad the noise is going to be, but uh, typically, uh, let's say that in a typical fMRI experiment, what to to overcome the noise and detects statistical patterns, we need let's say thirty to forty samples of each condition. So we we have what if, if let's say I'm interested in male faces versus female faces, I present forty male faces, forty female faces. And when I average them, the noise is sufficiently reduced uh, for, for one subject. And then I might have 20 participants in my experiment. So, no, so, so we have two levels of things. One have subject level, 
where you have by averaging the 40 items together, we get, uh, we eliminate some noise and then we do statistics across the whole population, across the population of 20 participants. And that should give further help in, 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 in uh, uh, reducing the noise. Uh, so that is the normal approach. Uh, there are some experiments where we are interested in more in the individual level uh, response because uh, we feel that if you are looking at fine-grained function in the brain, since each brain is different, the functional organization of each person is going to be different. You don't want to average across multiple people. And in those experiments, uh, what we do is we scan the same person multiple times. So we have a lot of scanning for a single person. So, uh, and a and lot of scanning for it. So we don't have 20 people. We might only have five people in their experiment, but each person is scanned a lot. So we have a lot of data for that person. And in that kind of experiment, we don't average across people. We just analyze each person on their own, uh, own terms because we have a lot more trials for that person. Okay. So that is also an approach, yeah. So one of the data sets we have is like that, where we are not trying to average across a lot of people, but we are, uh, one person was scanned four times uh, instead of just once. Uh, to get a more uh, to, to to get a be to better idea of the of their individual brain uh, brain organization, um, so this so th so this is the uh, uh, data we have now. The specific uh, specific data sets we have, I uh, can mention them. So one data set is about a li uh, listening to stories. So what subjects are, uh, they go in the scanner and an audio recording of some sort of a story or a narrative is played in the scanner in natural kind of more or less natural speech. So these are recorded, uh, recorded by actors and they are telling a story. And this is uh, about seven minutes, uh, six minutes long recording. So for six minutes, they are listening to this story which has about thousand words in it. Um, uh, and uh, what we have found is that even in this kind of recording, so I told you that it takes, after you process a stimulus like a single word, it takes you five seconds for the response to peak and then it will go down, right? So five, it's a long time. In five seconds, actually, you hear dozens of words. Um, but it is still possible to extract responses to individual words or individual categories of words uh, if you have enough data. Um, so one, one thing we want to do is to try to look at the stories, the, the, the time course, and then uh, put markers in the data for uh, particular, let's say, types of words or particular types of sentences that we are, that we are interested in, and then uh, extract the signal for them uh, from, this continuous, uh, uh, for, uh, from this continuous time series and see uh, that when these words are processed in this kind of naturalistic context, what areas of the brain are being activated or what networks of the brain are being activated. Uh, so this is, this is one data set like this, this story listening, uh, which is a continuous, like a six minute time series. So in this, we, we, we haven't chopped up into, we, we don't have this kind of classic uh, stimuli and conditions like faces or words or anything like that. We have a continuous time series where the signal will represent the mix of response to all the previous words that the person has heard. So it's a more complex data set, but we can extract information out of it. But is this story uh, of six minutes or so uh, constructed uh, with a specific objective in mind? Uh, are you saying that there are, uh, the story represents something very specific that you, uh, ex uh, you, you think would be a strong stimuli for, let's say, uh, emotion of particular kind or for example uh, you know mention of a child and whether it's in, supposed to invoke uh, you know uh, more more uh, uh, I guess different signal the versus uh, signal or uh, violence and supposed to invoke you know and say what, what what happens in the brain is that is that is it is it a on some standardization that has happened in terms of construction of the story itself that you are then evaluating this response to yeah, so that's a great question. So what we did, so this this was a very large scale project. So what we did was to create a number of different stories 
um, some of which are more generic and some of which are targeting some specific factor like you mentioned. So we have uh, two or three stories that are specifically uh, about emotion. So one is like a very happy story, one is a sad story. So we were looking to evoke this kind of emotion specifically to study emotions. Uh, there are some studies that are more uh, like um, a, uh, encyclopedia or Wikipedia entries, like just pure information that this is what is happens, this is how uh, animals move or some, some so it is not very uh, story-like. Um, so more, more narrative and then the other one, uh, the other kind of stories are actually some stories where there are people and there is something happening and something interesting and, you know, some bad event happens and there is a problem and then something happens and the problem is solved and then there is a conclusion where things end well. So you have this kind of a typical uh, structure of a story where you have characters, interaction between characters, problems occurring or uh, things going wrong, things going right. Um, uh, and so, so that, uh, so the idea was that we can look at a lot of different things from this, uh, di from this kind of stories because it's a very rich uh, stimulus. So, if you were interested in emotion, you could look at emotion. But if you were uh, uh, interested in, let's say, action related, uh, how people process action words, then you can mark. There's going to be a lot of action words occurring in a lot of stories, and you can mark them and compare them with other words that are not action related and then compare the two and then someone is, is this constructed by uh, 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 deciding the story or uh, you know uh, ahead of the time that i want to do this is or you take a broad brush it would have all these different things you look at what you want to uh, 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 see uh, you know what, what you are interested in the language and possibly find what what you saw in the stimuli yeah, so it is most of the stories. So we have 23 different stories. Most of them were was taken from different sources. They were existing sources and they were just chosen to add variety. Okay. So to, to deal with many different topics uh, to vary in complexity. So some of them are taken from like a fifth grade, like a textbook kind of material. So school level, like fifth grade kids can understand it or sixth grade kids can understand it. So they have relatively simple sentence structure, simple vocabulary. Some of them are podcasts or like articles on the web uh, that are for adults. Uh, so they were selected to have, have lots of variety in terms of what kind of topic you are dealing with what kind of words are being used, how complex the sentences are. Uh, and then a few stories were selected specifically like a return to evoke like emotions or other factors. So one of the things was about like irony. So we selected some passages that had an ironic ending. And one story, there is not a single story, but there are three, four, four different little stories that have each has an ironic ending. So we selected that specifically to look for this type of ironic processing. But general idea is that you should be able to look for uh, study, like whatever questions you have. There is enough stuff there so you can do a lot of different things. So uh, if I wanted to understand how human brain reacts to uh, what human perceives as a misinformation, is that so okay. doable? Um, misinformation, yeah. So that we have to look at the stories and see if there is any particular uh, uh, type of stories that uh, we, uh, that have that element in it it's it's, it's possible yeah there is something uh, something happening where somebody somebody is being misled somebody is being lied to and then uh, yeah but I, we did not have a specifically something dealing with misinformation but i think that is part of some of the stories yeah so uh, the reason I'm asking is that, for example, there are media report that um, uh, on social media, uh, uh, so, you know, use of certain emotions uh, lead to more engagement. Uh, on Facebook, for example, angry uh, cho choice of angry, those pe people are more engaged when they mark those uh, things as angry. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those stories are spread far and wide between. And um, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, that uh, empirical observation is supportable by a stronger response in human brain, as an example. Uh, right. 
right yeah that's entirely possible yeah yeah so so we we can we can look at uh, we have a lot of stories with like variation in emotion or how many emotion related birds occur and so on and in this data set it we might be able to look at that question uh, that you know uh, that kind of language does should produce uh, stronger activations in emotion re regions but possibly also in other general semantic regions uh, versus something that is kind of dry like academic kind of text which is just like information mm. uh, that would be interesting comparison yeah um so that is so this story listening is one data set and then there is the second data set so in this we have a large number of subjects uh, so far we have about 90 or 100 subjects i believe uh, but short amount of data so we have only 6 minutes worth of data uh, but we have a lot of people um and then we have this the the, th the third data set in this we were interested in uh, uh specific regions of the brain and we like the areas that especially are sensitive to semantic processing uh, they are called semantic hubs and we wanted to study the fine grain organization of these semantic hubs so these are areas like the anterior temporal lobe and angular gyrus so we selected a battery of different tasks that are known to activate these regions and we uh, scanned subject four times over this uh, seven or eight different tasks. Um, and so we have data sets for, I believe, about nine subjects going through this, like eight different tasks. Um, and each task is, I think, uh, Shuhan can probably tell you what the tasks are. Okay, I can share my screen, take a yeah. look at the task we have. Okay, can you see the screen? Yeah. Oh, uh, in the in the third data set, we have eight uh, tasks in total, and nine participants have go through uh, gone through the functional scanning. And one of the one task is about listening to the uh, the uh, uh, seven stories, and all of the other seven tasks is about or block design and in slow event related designs, which we can analyze in different conditions. For example, the first one, abstract semantics is in the screen, we can show the participant uh, dies a, a twice word. On the top of the screen, there is a prop word and on the top bottom, there are two words. Participants should uh, detect which, which one is close related to the prop word. And it is in two conditions, abstract or concrete, and we can build up a contrast like abstract versus concrete and to detect the neural imaging or a neural activation between the two conditions. And the second task is about past tense generation. In the screen, we'll show the one word, uh, one verb word, and the participant should We'll see the word for three seconds, and they need to name the past tense of the word. Uh, in one condition, is the word is in regular past tense, and another condition is in irregular past tense, like the the verb go and went and come came is is, is for irregular irregular verb. And like I can, I, I, I'm thinking, uh, regular verb. Talk, talked. Uh, so yeah, talk, any, talk. anything with ed would be regular. Yeah. So this yes. is looking at uh, like sint like basic syntactic processing. So this is a task that leverages more uh, like past tense generation is a classic task in psycholinguistic, and is associated with also these semantic hubs. So that is one of the tasks. Yeah. So then the number comparison, yeah, so that is like a baseline task. So that is a contrasting, everything else has words in it and meanings in it. 
uh, versus this is kind of a baseline where you are processing numbers, just comparing numbers and not, not you don't have these classic uh, semantic things, right? Um, then yeah, continue from uh, D is the story comprehension. Yeah, Juan, you can continue. Yeah, from uh, D. Okay. Story comprehension, the task is all the participants will listen to seven stories, just like uh, Dr. Desai mentioned in the second data set. And uh, we cannot build up any contrast because there are no uh, experiment design. Yeah, um, yeah so can... this, this is, I'll just clarify that this story is different from the other data set I mentioned. This is the same story that all participants uh, uh, listened to. This was, uh, I think this was uh, Alice in Wonderland, something like that, like a uh, uh, story. And uh, this was also uh, included for to study syntactic processing, but you can look at other things in it. But this, this, the third data set also has this uh, short uh, story task. Yeah. What does it right. mean when you say uh, uh, 40 stimuli and three minute 47 seconds of 40 stimuli and six minute? What does it mean? Right. So the, the uh, 40 refers to the number of items in, in each condition. So like in A, you have abstract words and concrete words. So it means we have 40 abstract words and 40 concrete words. And, and, the, and that whole uh, exercise lasted three minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah. So the whole task lasted this, this much. Okay. Because you are presenting one stimulus every few seconds. Typically, every four seconds or every five seconds, you present one, uh, one trial. So it will take you this much time to complete that, that part of the experiment. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't know why signal is really noisy and we need to increase the signal noise ratio. We need to present as much as stimuli as possible. So for each uh, task, we have more, the list is uh, 40 stimuli for each, each task. And for each round, the task will go through like from three minutes to, to seven minutes ish. And for the fifth task is emotion words. And we have three conditions, positive word, negative word, and neutral word. Participants need to, uh, to, to, to tell which one uh, make any judgment based on the commonness or anonymity of the word. And we, our contrast is positive versus neutral or versus negative. So neutral is a, a baseline. But we can still do other. Uh, typically, contrasts. people would use the word sentiment, positive or negative. Emotion would be anger, joy, uh, disgust. Uh, you know that kind of thing. Happiness. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 the, so, so these are yeah. Something is it something that you like or something that you don't like? Yeah. So, like joy or happiness is something that you would like. Uh, so, if if the word is let's say cake, you so might say that's emotions. Positive. Versus negative emotions, I see. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a valence. Yeah, in that uh, field, it is. This is called valence. So you are judging a positive valence versus negative valence. So are you are you um, expected to find different parts of the um, brain region uh, getting activated for positive uh, against negative, or are you find that uh, same? Uh, um, uh, brain region, uh, you know, react to either positive or negative because they recognize them. Uh, uh, it recognizes itself takes brain, uh, you know, activity, and yeah. that uh, you know there is a follow on follow through uh, the brain, which is you know in terms of positive versus negative. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, so of course there is a lot of things that are common between positive and negative words. So some areas that are involved in just the processing word form itself, understanding the meaning, uh, those are commonly activated. But then there are also typically some differences between positive and negative word. So if we are classifying, uh, you know, if you have a classifier, a classifier can be trained to distinguish between positive and negative words. So it will not use the common areas, but it will try to find voxels in the brain that are differentially responding to positive versus negative words. And we think that some of these voxels are in these uh, 
hubs, the, the semantic hubs that we are interested in. So yeah, in the interest of time, I'll just mention, yeah, that basically these are the different tasks that essentially load on slightly different function like social cognition or unique entities, which are like famous or non-famous faces or emotions or uh, abstract concrete difference and so on. But each of these is a, like a theoretically interesting question about how this type of uh, semantics is, is represented in the brain. So each of these, the, the contrast column could be a, if, if you have a, some sort of a classifier, you would train it to distinguish between these conditions. And you will try to find which areas of the brain are responding differentially to these conditions. And one question we are interested in is whether, are there, is there a set of voxels that is doing all of these tasks or most of these tasks or each of these classifications require different set of voxels, right? So is it the same area that is doing a lot of these different things? Or if I do, let's say past tense generation, the voxels that I find to be most informative that can classify this regular versus irregular, are the same voxels good also for emotion words and for recognizing famous versus non-famous things or not? So that's 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 one question. That is the kind of question we are asking here. So we want to analyze each task on its own merit and then compare and contrast and see if if there are areas of the brain that are sort of multifunctional that do a lot of things or they are specialized for specific domains. So it is specialization versus generalization because there is always a kind of a common theme and controversy in brain research that are brain areas specialized for one thing like just positive, negative emotion and they don't care about anything else or are there multifunctional areas that do everything and so on. Yeah. So that's the question we can answer using this type of uh, data set. So Juan has been working on uh, creating this like uh, uh, pre-processing this, this data and uh, getting them in a systematic form. So, you know, you can potentially, we can give you, for example, these uh, vectors or brain images corresponding to each of these conditions. And then you can take these brain images and then uh, train a classifier to, to see uh, what, uh, how, what level of, um, for example, classification you can get and whether you can identify regions of the brain or the voxels or the features that are the most relevant for making that classification. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Um, um, at this stage, uh, if that pre-processing is done, uh, in the sense that these are the stimuli, uh, then, it should be quite possible. Uh, what kind of uh, classification strategy will we use? Yeah, so so normally the 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 traditional method is is just a linear regression, right? And then people have used. Um, Support vector machines are a popular method of, of doing this. So they train a support vector classifier uh, for to, to distinguish these categories. So you if, if somebody is interested, you could use a support vector classification and then possibly use a deep learning classifier and see if, if it can do better or similar, give similar results, different results, or what type of architecture would be the most suitable. Um, uh, because there are many different kind of networks, deep learning networks you can have, but uh, is there a particular strategy that seems to be useful? Because typically the, the issue with this is that you have the, the amount of data is relatively less in the sense you have only, let's say 40 samples of one condition and 40 of another condition. You don't have, you know, 1 million versus 1 million. You have 40 yeah, versus 40. That's why uh, you would not expect deep learning to work better. Yeah. Or, or you, you know, it would be very viable. Yeah. So, um, so is there a data augmentation strategy or is there anything that can be done or 
you know, use a feature selection method ahead of time and then have relatively small set of features that, uh, that then uh, you can see, uh, try deep learning on or, yeah, that, that, that I don't know. It, yeah, it is possible that uh, deep learning doesn't work well when all is said and done, but uh, there might be some, some. Uh, well, uh, I'm, you know, what would be worth asking is, and I, I, I'm just throwing out there I, without uh, being sure that it will work is that, well, you know, if you can imagine that you are just feeding the data and, uh, you know, the data by itself um, is non-trivial, uh, and then ask it to automatically classify. There, maybe we can try out uh, deep learning and uh, see whether uh, it uh, perform how it performs without all the human uh, pre-processing that is being done here. You, uh, you mean uh, unsupervised, like not tell it that these are the categories or yeah. conditions and see if it can distinguish. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if the system comes up with uh, two different classes uh, that are, you know, uh, and then we decide that these classes, uh, whatever they represent for, is done well without having told exactly what those classes are and such. So that, that is another way of yeah. thinking about it. And yeah, that is certainly interesting. Yeah, interesting approach. Yeah, that can be, um, that would that would be interesting too, where if you give it data for all these different tasks and see like find any clusters that you can, like what, what is the pattern, what are the clusters? And then in those clusters, you see whether are there any, are certain tasks like A, C and D are being clustered together and versus the other three are being clustered together. So that tells us what, um, you know, uh, what is the underlying organization of the brain? How is it uh, uh, processing? Or, or uh, you know, possibly that, hey, uh, in this emotion thing, there is a, a part that is common, uh, you know, and uh, non-distinguished. And then there are parts that are common after, uh, uh, you know, uh, after some time. So meaning that there are uh, clusters that evolve based on the emotion and people follow the, the and the um, uh, activity region uh, uh, are, uh, you know, separate, uh, you know, after having a common part. So if you can observe that, that would be also very interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, I have to go in about five minutes to teach a class, but um, uh hopefully this was useful and then what uh i think our uh, next plan would be to should we have uh, some sort of in person meeting so my my thought is that we can start on the uh, lesion data and then one of the fmri tasks uh, i think this third data set is the most complex and it's going to take the most amount of time to process because there are so many tasks and so many things going on um, lesion data is relatively simple to process. So my, my thought is that if we can start um, on both fronts together, uh, because this will take more time, so it might be better to start early on this, the, the task three and start doing something, uh, making some kind of progress. Mm. And uh, uh, someone else can be working on the lesion data as well. Mm. Um, and uh, after we know, uh, once you guys know what the, the student has done so far and uh, what what other things uh, are worth uh, doing. Uh, so do you think that makes sense? Uh, trying to work on two things, two data sets at the same time? Let me, um, uh, let's think through that. Give us a little time, uh, you know, let, let's see what uh, Christian says. Let, uh, uh, let me hear with each of the part, you know, components here, each yeah. of the things. Uh, uh, I have no idea why Beruz, uh, not Beruz, uh, where Bezad uh, dropped, uh, he's supposed to be, you know, on this project and I don't know why he left. So uh, let me, let me. Okay, see. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. What yeah, so yeah, are... so I think, yeah, you guys can think about this and what seems interesting to who, and uh, you know, if there yeah, is something, 
Yeah, yeah. By and large, you know, you'll fi find a way to address all of them. But uh, yeah. let's see uh, who can get started when kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah and since, since there are uh, quite a few person on the call, uh, if, if there's two uh, data set that you want to move forward at the same time, if we if we have different people that can work on the on, on the two, I think it's more easy. If it's the same person processing or the same person, the plural, <laughs> processing uh, the two data set, maybe it's easier to start with one so that uh, you know, you don't have to do too much context switching between the exactly. two, uh, yeah, two right. paradigms. Also, because they are not both fMRI, one would be a structural MRI and the other fMRI. So there's yeah. different uh, consideration. Right. I, I have to jump on another call, like right now, I'm actually a bit late, uh, but I, I look forward to continue this discussion. Oh, right. Thanks, yeah, thanks for coming. My pleasure, bye. Okay, talk to you soon, bye. All right. So yeah, I think uh, yeah. So uh, we can uh, we can meet again sometime to discuss other plans. But this I think hopefully gives you something to think about and uh, see how how we can process. And in the meantime, Shuan will be will work on getting the data ready to possibly you know hand over to you guys at some point and then uh, explain the exact structure and so on. And sure. I think it, it might be also good for somebody whoever is working on the project to get some training from us in like visualizing the data, for example, uh, using the software to look at the brain, uh, how to see the MRI images, how to see the fMRI images, activations, and so on. So it gives you a good grounding on like, you know, what the data is. Yes, so yes, we, we, we can show that all of that to yeah, anybody who is working on the data. Yeah, yeah. Right, that, that'll be helpful. I will yeah. be also interested in learning that, so seeing that yeah. person, yeah, yeah, so sounds good. Um, in terms of the work, uh, guys, uh, you know, uh, Yuxin, uh, you know, Deepa and uh, Behruz, uh, send me your thoughts on, uh, you know, generally how comfortable and interested you guys are on this. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, from the current team, the three of you are the, uh, you know, primary candidates to uh, work once you, once you are, you know, so if there are two things again, what are the two things you want us to work on? Uh, uh, this the, the the like the uh, we are calling this the uh, multitask data set. That is data set number three, which has a number of different fMRI tasks, and then the and the lesion symptom mapping is the first one here. So the lesion data set and the multitask data set. Let's let's use the terms. Lesion data set, multitask data set, and the story data set. Right, there are three. Mm. So, okay. Uh, and and the remind me, the lesion data set is uh, a lot of data on few people or the other way around. Uh, the, the 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 multitask data set is a lot of data on a few people. The story data set is a small amount of data on a lot of people. And uh, uh, and the other one, uh, lesion. L lesion. Lesion. We have, I think, about two hundred patients. So we have a lot of patients. Yeah, we have. So it's also a very rich data set. Uh, some measures are available for like two hundred patients. Some are available for sixty or seventy patients. So, so and, have, and that's a primarily classification in the sense that, uh, what are the um, uh, uh, functions of the lesion that you identified, right? For the regions in a particular region, what functions uh, are affected? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like knowing that if I if I give you a task like a particular behavioral measure list of uh, behavioral values like picture naming, that these are hundred patients. This is their performance on picture naming. Some are good, some are bad. Can you tell me? which areas of the brain are the most critical for doing picture naming. So the, the output of the method would be like a lesion map, actually a map of the brain, which will identify like the areas that are most critical, somewhat less critical, you know, have a, some sort of weight or value uh, sh saying how critical it is for this picture naming task. Great. I think that's interesting. Clear, relatively clear. So, um, guys, uh, you know, 
think about it uh, i'll share the video with you guys and uh, let's see you know what you feel comfortable you know one person you know we have since we have two projects we starting with you know there'll be one person each uh, involved uh, and then others can help out as need be and there will be more people involved all right so see you guys later yeah. Some, uh, nice meeting you all, all right. of you thanks, thanks. Yeah. yeah bye So exciting work, guys. Talk to you soon. Good to see you, Basil.